about uh, technology and healing. I think most of us in the room, we are very tired of listening that the pace of technology is really unstable. So the world is moving in such a way that today, even our weight is being transformed to one and zeros, or zeros and one. I mean, technology is like what is moving in the world today. And uh, once you say sometime uh, that whatever you're thinking, it's it. The it there refers to IT. So everything is trying to be, I mean, connected to IT today. So many countries are just involved in the technology development in the world. And the developing countries also, somehow, they are touched by technology. And Haiti, as a developing country, is also moving with technology. Slow, but we are moving. So before studying, my name is Pierre Lovens Leolien. I'm from Haiti. I am Humphrey Fellow. Humphrey Fellow, the Humphrey Fellowship Program is a um, development of the program that brings to the US mid-career accomplished professional to spend one year here in the US taking experience and taking paid classes. So I was the only Haitian selected this year to represent my country in the program. So my background is um, technology, and then I spent uh, six years working as ICT product specialist by a private company back home. So before we start about technology, let's try to see what we're gonna review. We're gonna review where is that Haiti, why I'm trying to expand the impact of technology in Haiti, what is the, um, I mean, the shape of the economy in Haiti, and then we'll go to the evolution of technology in Haiti, and then we'll see the opportunities and the challenges that we have, and then we'll conclude. So before starting, we'd like to point out that Haiti is the Caribbean countries. We are, we share borders, um, um, borders with the um, Dominican Republic, and then we are very close to Cuba. And then in the other side of Haiti, I mean down the map, I think, we are very next to Florida, part of the US. So this is Haiti. Now, Talking about Haiti, we know Haiti is a poor country, but how? What does the data say about Haiti? Um, currently, we have a GDP of uh, 8.2 billion dollars. Yeah, this is information is for the year 2016. And uh, the growth, the GDP growth for that year was 1.5, and the inflation is 13.3. So we can see there what's, what, what, why countries considered very poor because we have a very low growth of GDP and then we have a very high inflation rate. And uh, when I was a little boy, I was always thought that Haiti is the agricultural, I mean the farming countries, and then this has changed over the time because many people left the countryside, they go to the, the big cities. So there's a shift also in the shape of the economy of Haiti. Instead of being now a, a very big farming country, we become to be a service country, this stats shows. So we have few people farming for the country. Um, before I go deep to the, to the, to the um, conversation today, I wanna say that I don't have information to share for one hour, I could, but I decided to have like 20, 25 minutes of presentation, then we'll discuss, so we can discuss. So, um, in Haiti, we started to have community um, technology very early in the 1960s year, with the creation of the first telecom company in Haiti, then it was Telecommunication SA, but the short name for it is Telecom. We had this created in the 60s. This entity was like a mixture of the private and, uh, and government investment to build the company in Haiti. It was the only company in Haiti from the 60s to the to 98. So from there, this year we had two new companies created in Haiti. One was Hightail, the other one was Comsel. And that year the competition started to, you know, to burn there because we had two private investments and they were very huge. But at that time we had a, I mean, from 98 to uh, 92, 2005, we still had in Haiti like a very high rate of communication because we had to pay for the outgoing calls we have to be also for the incoming calls. Until 2005, with Digicel, which is a company that operates in 32 countries in the Caribbean, they initiated the activities in Haiti, and then they opened the market in such a way that the rate come very low. When Digicel came, 
we free the market in social media. We don't pay for the incoming call. We are only for the outcoming call. But we still have to pay for the incoming, uh, I mean, very high rate for the SMS, so, uh, so, uh, short messages. Over the time, we decided to just decrease the rate for the outgoing SMS. And then in 2005, GSL came at the biggest investment in technology in Haiti. But then in 2007, before 2010, we had a shock in the market. Teleco, the first mixture of private and uh, public private partnership telecom company, they were caught. They exit the market, leaving around 2,000 people jobless. That's created a very big shock in the country because we are already very poor, and then we have that many people left without a job. But um, in 2010, the government, the Haitian government together with the, the um, Vietnamese government, they open an operation and they create a new um, company in Haiti, the name is the National Communication SA, which is NAPCOM. So the Haitian government has 60% of the actions of this company, and the Vietnamese government has the other 40% of the actions of the company. But um, in 2012, Digicel, or Comcel. And previously, Hytel, I think it was in 2011, they also been bought and then they exit the market. So we bought Digital about Comcel, and then Hytel doesn't exist anymore. Today we have only two full technology operators in Haiti. I mean full because I'm going to explain, because we have, like in Haiti we have two types of service providers. We have the complete uh, service provider, and then we have some who are on, uh, only dedicated to um, internet service. So we have only those two providing the service. And this is the part for the ISP, which is the internet service provider. The ISP story is a bit different because, yes, we are telling also providing internet, but in the 90s, we had MCI, in Haiti, providing service only to the U.S. Embassy and then the U.S. Mission in Haiti, where well, MCI. But because MCI had a big network, there was another company called Intel Focus. They decided, oh yeah, we can take advantage of this. We can open a partnership with them to use their network to provide service to the public. So we had the Intel Focus with the I mean, with a partnership with MCI, offering also internet service to. And then in the other hand, we have the, this is the biggest private investment in Haiti, ACN, Alpha Communication Network. They started also to provide service, internet service only in Haiti. We also have Access Haiti, also private, created by Haitian. And we have Hynet. There is a trick here. Hynet and Access Haiti, they are the same, they are, they are, they are for the same, they are to the same owner. They created this like distraction to put in the head of people that is the competition. So in the public's mind is that Access Haiti provides better service, but I highlight it's cheaper. So they created the competition among themselves, so people still believe it. And then we have Digicel, which is one of the last companies came to the market, and then we have Nightcom. And Digicel was, as I said, starting in 2005 and Nightcom in 2010. So why I started to explain where communication comes from in Haiti and what can be the opportunities for, for somebody to want to invest in Haiti is because we are a small country, but we are overpopulated. We are around 11 million people in Haiti. And what a very interesting fact about Haiti is that approximately 43% of the, of the um, population is under 18. So we are a very young population. And then you know, the youth, they are angry for technology. So it's a very good market for people to come invest. And then if you look at the population ranking among the Caribbean countries, Haiti is number three in size in terms of population. So some investment in Haiti and technology in Haiti is a good business for whoever wants to invest there. Important thing about Haiti also is the usage, the internet usage. 
I mean, compared to the other countries in the region. Currently, we are like, uh, we're, we have only 7% of our population using internet, I mean, in terms of um, the region. While Cuba, I was surprised when I was doing the research to see that Cuba has 20% of its population using the internet, while the Dominican Republic is far ahead with 33%. And I was also surprised to see Jamaica has only 9%. Why I'm, I was surprised is because in Jamaica, not, not only Digicel, which is the biggest company in Haiti, has its headquarters in Jamaica, but also there are many service providers like Flow and Audi, I don't even know the name. But I was surprised to see only 9% of this population has access to the internet. So not only Haiti is a very good market for investment in technology today, it's also all the Caribbean countries actually represent a very good market for, for technology. So if you look at the market rate here, this is um, on move, move on subscriber. I mean, I mean uh, people who have a phone, to make call at least. If we see here, Haiti has like 70% of its population having access to telephone. But how many of them have access to internet? We're gonna see this next slide. It's only, 11% of the population. Again, there's a big gap here. So there's a need for investment in internet service in Haiti. So service providers international, they are very welcome in Haiti to invest in, in the market. Now, what does the sector represent for the economy of the country? This data, unfortunately, I could not update it. I was trying to update it. I could not update it. I have it as for um, 2011, in between the top five biggest tax payers to the government, we have two. We had two telecommunication companies in Haiti back in 2011. They were the top five. With Digicel, the number one telecommunication company in Haiti being the third biggest. So that means the, poten the potentiality for the country to benefit from investment in the field of technology in Haiti is very huge. See? And uh, yeah. <clears throat> one of the biggest challenges we have in Haiti is um, the regulation. It's very difficult for somebody to go in Haiti and say, I want to I wanna, I wanna invest in technology. Why? Because I think the latest version that we have for the power regulation is like 1987. We can imagine when we had our regulation of first regulation, which is the latest we are using still, the internet was not even so popular in the world. I think the internet started to be very popular in '96, right? So we still need to work there. We have a lot of to do there because we don't. Today, everybody's talking. I think when I was reading an article the other day, I think since the internet is moving so fast, people are thinking about now not only about providing service, now we're thinking about protecting information. I mean, Haiti has missed all the revolutions. The latest revolution was the technological one. And I think we are, we are about to lose the next thing in the world because we are just, we have a very old regulation. And I think that's where I personally would like to work a lot for my country, to help improve the regulation we have in to get to today. But why? We have we don't have enough or more investment in Haiti because we have a lot of confidence from the actors and from the investors because they don't trust the country. We always have like political issues in the country, so people don't want to risk their money. So going to Haiti to invest money is a big risk. And Dennis O'Brien, the owner of Digital Haiti, he explained in one interview that he had when he decided to invest in Haiti, people say, Are you crazy? All these people were asking him, why do you want to invest in that country? Where we had in less than 10 years, we have, we don't know how many governments, how many presidents, how many issues. Are you crazy? He says, I want to invest there because my heart wants me to do something in that country. So, from there, I have a reflection. I said, oh, investment and heart. So, how do we match that? Because I'm putting my money because my heart tells me or because I see a need of making money. So I think it's both, kind of both. You invest what you feel like doing and what you think also you have a market. And then, believe it or not, in Haiti we have a market for investment because of, the, of all the reasons I explained earlier. 
and was sorry because they liked the country, they did it. it's a big investment. Because of the list of uh, O'Brien and investment in Haiti, today we have Marriott Hotel in Haiti. He also bought this investment in Haiti together with the Tisha Sellers. That's big. One of the biggest, one of, one of the challenges we have in Haiti is corruption. Corruption is, whatever you try to do in Haiti, like, every, every I mean, all the places they are corrupted. I'm, I'm like ashamed to tell you, but it's the truth. And then this prevent a big progress in the I mean, technological um, environment in here. However, technology also can help to solve this corruption issue. So what is an issue for, for development of the technology in Haiti can be solved by technology. This is strange, right? So, one of my guest personal is trying to encourage my country to, to, to do the switch. Go and invest in technology. Do whatever you can do to encourage people to go and invest in technology. And then we'll use this tool to fight corruption. Because corruption, everybody knows what it can generate, right? So a very public country cannot, it cannot be developed. It's impossible. Because all the money of the country is going for the way. And then we would like also, I think the government needs to invest more in Haiti because, I put this point, is because when I check in Haiti, we don't have a national platform, we don't have a big government investment in Haiti. We have Digicel buying its internet from the US, bringing it overseas to reach and distribute it to Haiti. And then we have Natcom, we also do the same. And all the other internet um, service providers, they get their service from the Dominican Republic and they share it. So we don't really have a government implication in the investment in the technology in Haiti. So because of that, I think those are the main challenges that we have in order to make technology a reality in, in, in Haiti. So, um, as Final thought, from what I've seen, my observation is that, as I said previously, investing in the technology is investing in fighting against corruption. It's boost the economy of the country. And uh, in such a way, it's encouraging the, the, the economic growth of the country. You for a time to shot and then push. Under the water, like actually on the ocean. They bring it from there mm -hmm. to a and then from there they distribute it. They are like the distribution center. That's what we get. And not from the same And then for redundancy from back up, they have like a like a they have a connection, they have a service also, they are they buy a service from Dominican Republic too. Just for back up. Because in the 2010, with the earthquake, all the communications started in Haiti. Except at that time, the first company with the market, which was uh Hyatt, during the earthquake, they were the only company that were able to provide service, I mean, at least telephone service in Haiti. And that's strange to me because they were the only company that were doing CDMA at the time. CDMA, that's, they don't use SIM card. It's like Sprint here, right? I think Sprint is the only one doing CDMA here now in the US. Sprint? Um, yeah, I think. So that was trend to everybody because we think GSM, LT, 4G, they are the biggest thing. And during the effort, the only company that was providing service at that time was the CDMA company, which is strange. So if you were going to recommend um, a strategy for uh, bringing uh, internet access to the population of Haiti, where would you, where would you start? Who would you serve first? Uh, and, uh, and 
I mean, I guess I, I can think of a couple different ways of doing it. Maybe starting with young people in school, um, bringing you know, internet access to computers in school, or marketing to whatever middle class there is, or uh, and my question on um, both of you is that, uh, we should start with school. School is amazing, but how to start school? Because school is one of the poorest sector in, in, the, in, the, in the country. I mean, they don't have enough money to invest in that. So to start with school, I think, again, we need a very real government engagement in investing in the infrastructure. And then also helping developing programs that encourage young people to use the technology. Actually, we are like using it in such a way because most of us, I mean the young people, we have a phone, we have an iPhone, and we use the internet. But to do what? To the mainly Facebook, WhatsApp, and Twitter, and social network. That's what we do most. So, um, I like the question because today in Haiti we have something that I missed to explain in my school in my presentation, and it's big. We have like, from Bali, he studied in the US, he was, also, uh, he was also a scholarship program in the US. He created in Haiti today what's called uh, technology ecosystem in Haiti. What he's trying to do is trying to bring all the startup companies, telecom a technology company, in one place. He has one building, training, investment, and coach them to do the kind of investment. So uh, this is very new in Haiti. It started last year. And this kind of initiative we need to have them more. Not only the government to be involved, but also us, as young people who are trained, who know what the knowledge we can share with them. So I think, yeah, the school is where to start, but with a very deep government engagement, and also public citizenship, I mean, citizen engagement too. That's what I think. Um. I thought it was interesting that 32% in the Dominican and um, I think mean, 9%. Mm -hmm. uh, um, 11%. Yeah. No, um, in Haiti, what? No, it's 32% in the Dominican Republic. Yes. And 9 or 11%. Yes. Right? And then the challenges. Can you go back to that challenges list? I didn't investigate about the Dominican Republic, mm -hmm. but I can see where we are weaker. Okay. Because I know we are very weak there. I know we are very weak in this. We are very important. And I know also we don't really have a government investment in technology in the, in the challenges. So I think maybe that's where the Dominican Republic is better than us. Even though we are also a big country, from what I have heard. Mm -hmm. But maybe not as much as us because we are very close in. And I would have to go back to see how frequently they go to the laws, the regulation. Because you cannot foster technological development without checking <coughs> the laws because they are what govern the sector. So I have another question, which is less scientific and more personal, right? Which is, um, the, um, so you talk about becoming a services mm -hmm. um, uh, society. Uh, I've been to the Dominican Republic probably four times in the last 20 years as a tourist. And every time I go, there's more tourism. And there's more investment from the tourism sector. So I would expect, although I don't know this for sure, but I would expect that the that that um, industry is creating pressure for the kind of access um, that you're talking about. It's not necessarily to the population, uh, but to have that kind of capability available to attract tourists uh, in the tourist industry and to be able to run all the businesses that are necessary for that. And then we know the consequences for the old folks. So um, if you think about public investment, what about private investment in industry? Is there enough stability um, 
on the horizon uh, in Haiti for the economy to, to, to begin to diversify um, even to the area of, of things like tourism, which I think uh, we don't want to, I go to Dominica, I wouldn't have gone back, but couldn't have access, and I couldn't do the kind of things that I wanted to do, and I didn't have people there who, who understood kind of the global context to be able to provide programs and services. So, can you talk um, more about that? Yeah. I guess I realize it's not your field, but no, no, you no, are no. a citizen, okay. right? No, it's okay, it's okay. Um, because I, it's not my direct field, but it's a challenge of mm -hmm. communication. So, I, yeah, I think uh, when you invest in one field, which is so useful as technology, you are investing in the world for your country. Because if you invest in technology, you will I mean, you open all the, all the sectors in the country. And of course, they are, I think, they became the number one tourist country in the, in the Caribbean region. They were not until like 2005. Who is? The, the, the Dominican Republic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really? Until 2005, they were not the number one. It was Cuba. I think only like 2005, 2006, 2006, they became the number one. Why? Because of this. And then, Talking about the private investment, in Haiti we have some kind of private investment in the sector. But is it enough? That's the question. There is no study. The market is like open to everyone to come. But people don't come because they fear to lose their money because of instability, because of all those problems that, that we have. But I mean, there is no, there, we don't have the law that says this person can invest, this cannot invest. We, we don't have this barriers in the society. And then, I think the NATCOM experience is, is is being very positive in Haiti. NATCOM where we have the Haitian government with the Vietnamese government, they are having this big investment in Haiti. And this is that is purely private. This is owned by one person. Is that is that even an SA? This is that SA. It's a one person company which operates in thirty two countries. So we still can have this mixture in the country. And then have a yeah. Building on some of Teresa's comments, um, I hear, first of all, thank you so much for your presentation. It was very interesting to know about your country. But I, I feel that you place so high expectations on the technology itself. And I was thinking about Teresa's question about the differences between Haiti and um, the Dominican Republic. I do not know Haiti, but I do know the Dominican Republic. And what I feel is that there is more political stability, and a lot of it has to do with the human component. So in, in Republican, uh, Dominican Republic, in the last few years, there have been young public managers taking the leadership of public organizations, particularly in the, in the national, uh, national public administration organization that were engineers or that were very interested in technology. So that human component, their experience, their background also pushed uh, technology implementation in the country and that's when they started to do all these initiatives and they wanted to particularly in Central America and the Caribbean wanted to be number one when it came to technology and actually um, the Republican Demo uh, the Dominican Republic is doing very interesting implementing very interesting projects but that were again pushed by that human component that maybe Haiti doesn't have so maybe it is not so much about investing in technology, but also about having that capability in public organizations that uh, push the investment in technology and that makes sense um, of the inve investment of technology. I, had a, a very, I have a very similar uh, comment when it comes to corruption, and I wanted to ask you, is it about petty corruption, or are we talking about big corruption? Because if it's about petty corruption, technology is not going to solve the problem. And we have had experiences in, in Asia and in other Latin American countries led by the World Bank that says that petty corruption doesn't, is not solved with technology, because again, it is the human component. So maybe other than you know, technology and investment in technology and bringing the companies together, there's need to be an investment in human capital, both in the population and of course in public organizations. Thank you for the question. I would like to start, to start with the last part of the question, which is about the pity of the 
corruption. It's both in GD. It's both. It's really both. And uh, at some point, I really agree that technology cannot stop the future corruption, but it can help to decrease it. Let me put an example in Haiti. What's happening today? To have a passport in Haiti, just a passport, which is an ID document. It's a headache. You go to the office, the queue is very long. Somebody comes to you and tells you, you know what, if you want to, to get the passport tomorrow, give me that much money and then I'll give you the passport. And you can go there two, three, four times. You don't get the passport because you don't pay this person. I think this is a pretty corruption. Just for ID, it's a pretty corruption. The government solved this issue. People will press the passport online and get it. I, I, I think at some point it can help to solve even pretty corruption. I, I agree, but again, it is the human mentality. So uh, I worked a lot in Bolivia and we did something very similar. And we thought if we are going to implement technology for different procedures, passport um, <coughs> applications included. Um, you know, they'll have the online system, so they will need to go online, and therefore those public officers will, won't ask for any money. So what we finally found is that it's still, they said, okay, do not do it online, come, I'll give you the passport or whatever other procedure sooner, and I'll take care of doing it online for you. And then you give me some money for, for me to do that, right? So. So although there was an online system put in place for certain electronic services, still those public servants, you know, and of course what we were anything related to other initiative of the technology. So so I think that that that, that could be, you know, as you said, an alternative that you have few uh, tele centers that are serving huge communities, but they are mostly funded, you know, by you know government. Yes. And that would, you know, that could be a good complement for other, you know, initiatives okay, that are more, you know, technology oriented. I totally agree with you. Yeah. And uh, one of the problems about that is also, if we look at the Haitian University, the system, many of the faculties they don't really have a good, I mean, laboratory. They don't really have real access to to technological services. Even the university, the public university mainly. The private, yes, because they are private and they need an investment. So again, talking about referring to public investment, if you don't invest even in the universities, how about the basic schools? So the problem is, is all the way there. So what to do is, again, there is what to do. What to do is, it's possible. Because sometimes people say, no, it's a poor country, we don't have money. Yes, we do have money. We don't have a lot of money, but we do have money. But we have to spend based on requirements. Of course, I like the point that Mila raised about uh, corruption to survive. Yes, people, they are like, they want to survive. So if you want to say, okay, my priority is <coughs> ending the hunger, okay, it's your priority then. Solve it. Spend all the money in that. In so everybody will have to see the change because it's your choice. But if you don't make that choice, what other choice are you are making? See? It's defining the priorities. That's what we, I think, we should do. Yeah. Is there any investment at all of international organizations in, in in terms of technology? Mm, I think yes, because I am aware of some projects. Um, the biggest issue with the international community investing in technology and AD is that the investment is for very short term. For the election, I remember, and uh, it was in 